actually I've already left the University of Missouri, so right now I'm enjoying some personal time. Um, but, but I'm ecstatic to be starting here in December and, and really looking forward to it. I, I love Göttingen and this would be a fun place to, to move to. So my talk today is about identifying selection on quantitative traits. Um, and, and I want to emphasize before I even start that I'm going to talk about finding selection on traits, not finding genes that are under selection. So Bruce gave a really great talk yesterday that talked a lot about how can we find selection on, on specific loci. Um, and this is a little bit different. How can we use genomic information to find which traits have been under selection? Um, I've started every single one of my talks for the last several years with this figure, um, just defining how I think about quantitative genetics and what, what the field is. So, so it's, of course, the study of inherited continuously variable traits. And human height is the most common example of a continuously variable quantitative trait. Um, this 100-year-old picture shows that if you line a group of people up according to their height, um, people fall into a wonderful normal distribution uh, that you can do a lot of statistics on. So the reason I like this picture so much is that it emphasizes the unbreakable links between quantitative genetics and math and statistics, uh, especially statistics. So in plant populations and animal populations, um, most, I, I would argue, most agricultural traits that we care about are, are quantitative. So this includes yield and flowering time, um, and in animals, things like litter size or body weight and, and so on. These are all continuously variable, um, likely controlled by a large number of small effect genes. In the past, we studied quantitative genetics based on distributions of phenotypes uh, using tools like the Breeders' Equation to, to understand how a population will change in response to selection. In the present, we use a lot of genetic and genomics tools like QTL mapping, genome-wide association studies, um, genomic selection, and most, more recently, selection scans to understand uh, links between genotypes and phenotypes. So to, to motivate the rest of my talk where, when I'm going to get into uh, selection on traits and how can we find that, I want to make the point that selection can take many different forms. Um, Bruce yesterday told us a lot about some of the types of selection, whether we have hard sweeps or soft sweeps or incomplete sweeps um, or polygenic adaptation. And, and I want to use the story of maize domestication to demonstrate that there can be a complicated array of forms of selection that are affecting a population um, and that any single tool doesn't necessarily <coughs> describe the whole situation. So this is Tio uh, uh, grass from central Mexico 10,000 years ago, and it's still around today. Um, and humans domesticated teosinte from maize by repeatedly selecting the best in the reverse. Humans domesticated maize out of teosinte by repeatedly selecting the best individuals over time. Uh, here's another fun picture that depicts some of the changes that take place over time. This is from the Smithsonian Institute. And on the left is a very, very old maize cob um, collected from an archaeological site. It's something like 5,000 years old uh, to show sort of the state of maize 5,000 years ago. And on the right, we have a maize cob from, I think, about 1,000 years ago. And, and the intermediate pictures are marching forward in time. <coughs> so you can see how selection has improved the crop. So we can ask the question, what, what forms of selection have have been undergoing, or what forms of selection has maize been undergoing to, to improve like this. I almost pulled this slide from my talk because Bruce did such a good job describing these different types of selection yesterday, but I, I left it in because I want to demonstrate one of the possible forms of selection that could describe maize evolution. So, so that's the case of a classical selective sweep or a hard sweep. Uh, imagine that you have a number of different haplotypes in a population. So each of these blue bars represents a different individual carrying its own set of genetic variants. All of the black dots in this picture are, are neutral variants, and, and the red dot is a potentially a new beneficial mutation that, that's appeared that's going to make maize better. 
When selection occurs, this will rise in frequency in the population until it's fixed. Uh, and then we'll have, because of linkage, a region of the genome that's reduced in variability throughout the whole population. So if we look at some measure of genetic diversity, uh, what we have is neutral diversity across that segment of the genome before selection and a reduction of diversity across that segment of the genome after selection. Now, there's a really neat way that you can look at genetic information to find out how prevalent has this form of selection been during evolution. And the way we can do that is to look at levels of diversity surrounding synonymous substitutions and non-synonymous substitutions. So of course, uh, a non-synonymous mutation has the potential to be functional, and a synonymous mutation doesn't have the potential to be functional. It makes no change in the protein. Um, the substitution is a fixed difference between an ancestor and a current population. So if we look at the pattern of genetic diversity surrounding synonymous substitutions, these shouldn't be fixed due to selection. They should be fixed due to drift alone, and we'd expect to see relatively neutral levels of diversity. Um, then if we look surrounding non-synonymous substitutions, and we see a reduction of diversity um, surrounding this class of substitution, this would suggest that there's been a lot more, or that, that hard sweeps, or this classical form of selection I just described, has been a driving force of evolution. So we can look at this pattern averaged over all substitutions in the genome in order to determine how important has, have hard sweeps been. And this was done several years ago in both flies and humans, and it's since been done in many species, um, and we see different patterns in different species. So here's, here's what we see in flies, uh, Drosophila fruit flies. There's a reduction of diversity surrounding non-synonymous substitutions that's several fold greater than the, the reduction of diversity surrounding synonymous substitutions. This indicates that hard sweeps or selection on beneficial new mutations have really been one of the forces that have primarily shaped Drosophila evolution. In humans, we see a very different pattern. Um, humans show that you have similar reductions of diversity for both non-synonymous or surrounding both non-synonymous and synonymous substitutions. This indicates that for humans, hard sweeps on new mutations or strong selection on beneficial new mutations have not been the primary driver of evolution, but it's been something else. So now let's talk about maize. Um, we did a study several years ago where we looked at a collection of maize land races from across the U.S. Uh, and one of my figures has some teosinte data on it too, but I'm not really going to talk much about teosinte. Um, and we looked at what, what's been the pattern of diversity around these substitutions. And we see something just like the pattern for humans. So in the red is the average level of diversity surrounding non-synonymous substitutions, and the lighter gray is surrounding synonymous substitutions. And patterns are almost identical. So this suggests that there's been some type of selection other than hard, or hard sweeps, other than strong selection on new mutations that's shaped maize diversity. Um, I want to emphasize this doesn't mean there's been no cases where there's large domestication genes that have been strongly selected, um, such as TB1 or TGA1. There's several known examples of, of strong selection on good mutations in maize, but overwhelmingly that's probably not what's shaped maize diversity. And there's the, the expectation. So there's another type of selection that, that often takes place in genomes, basically always takes place, um, and that's purifying selection. So here's the second of three cartoons I'm going to show. When you have purifying selection, you have selection against new deleterious mutations. So here's a bunch of individuals, again, all carrying their own black dots, their own sets of neutral polymorphisms. And now I've added some genes. And suppose you just randomly mutate a gene. Chances are the new mutation is going to be deleterious. It probably breaks gene function or does something not good more often than not. So if we tend to purge new mutations out of genes, uh, we end up with genes that are all kind of similar for the most part. When we look at levels of diversity inside genes relative to outside genes, we'll see lower genetic diversity inside genes. This is sort of a, a very common phenomenon that, that almost by definition um, is something that's observed in organisms. 
And sure enough, we observe it in both maize and maize today. So this is a, a figure showing on the left the average level of diversity right at a gene, and moving away to the right is just as you get farther from a gene, you can see genetic diversity is increasing. Uh, so this actually describes also why we see that reduction of diversity for non-synonymous or for synonymous substitutions in maize. If I go back a couple slides, this, why is the gray reduced? It's because not, synonymous substitutions have to be inside genes, and there's just generally lower diversity inside genes than outside. So anyway, this tells us that purifying selection has been important in maize, um, and of course, I just mentioned that hard sweeps on new mutations have not been a driving force of evolution. But this brings up sort of a, an important question, which is purifying selection keeps things the same. We know that maize is getting better, so, so not everything can be explained by purifying selection in maize. Uh, there has to be more going on. And <clears throat> likely there's been lots of polygenic selection or selection on many alleles of small effect. There's my figure for that. So, so a quantitative trait such as yield, uh, which is likely controlled by many alleles of small effect, um, may be undergoing polygenic selection which, as Bruce told us yesterday, is, is really hard to map the genes because it leaves a small signature in the genome. And now I'll just depict why that is. This is the last cartoon. Um, here you have a population before selection. And now let's imagine that each of those new beneficial mutations, these red dots, has a very, very small effect and that there's many, many red dots spread across the genome. Then over time, each of these red dots might increase in frequency by a little bit. Uh, so here, that red dot has doubled now in the post-selection population. There's two of them. I meant to delete the gene 1, gene 2, gene 3 from this figure, so ignore that. Uh, this dot increased to frequency 2, so there's more of those. So, so we can imagine that if the red dots are good, this population is better than that population. But there's no overwhelming um, pattern emerging at e any of the selected sites. So this, this is a problem for mapping. Uh, but in a minute, I'll show you there's some other things we can do beyond mapping. So here's a couple of case studies. Um, first, I want to talk again about human height. This is figures from the Wood study in 2014, which, which was a really uh, large study, um, the type of thing that, that human geneticists are able to do, but plant and animal geneticists sometimes have trouble acquiring the resources for. Uh, they had 250,000 sequenced individuals uh, that were also phenotyped. So this is huge data set. Um, and with that massive gazillion euro data set, they were able to identify 697 genetic variants associated with human height. I want to note that those 697 variants only explain 20% of the genetic variation for height, so likely there's several thousand variants associated with height. So that's good, we have this subset of variants that, that maybe contribute to height, but if we want to ask the question, has height been under selection in human populations, um, we have to think a little harder. So Graham Coop and Jeremy Berg uh, developed a method to identify a signal of polygenic adaptation or a signature of selection on a quantitative trait. Um, that's really applicable to this type of human setting with massive data sets. Uh, the general approach of their study is they take all of those GWAS hits that have been published, so if there's a set of 697 variants associated with height, they're going to look at the GWAS effects estimate from each of those, so does it have a positive or negative effect, and then they'll look at the distribution of allele frequencies across different populations. And if one population's been selected for low height and another population for high height and one for intermediate height, um, then you get different allele frequencies at each of these GWAS effects estimates. So this is a, a really exciting direction that this field of selection on quantitative traits has started moving in, but it doesn't do us too much good in, in the plant and animal world because I don't have a set of 697 variants that contribute to maize yield or, or any other um, quantitative trait. So now I want to get a little more into the story of, of maize, and I want to motivate some work that we've done to develop a plant and animal 
specific approach for, for mapping polygenic or for identifying polygenic selection that's applicable in, in these populations. So I'm going to talk about the Wisconsin quality synthetic population, which is a maize population, a breeding population from Wisconsin um, that underwent <coughs> five cycles of selection, five cycles of reciprocal recurrent selection, where each cycle consists of about five generations, so this is 20 or 25 generations of selection for an increase in the quality of maize silage. Now silage is this ground up plant that you, or you take the maize, you grind it up, and you feed it to a cow. Um, the traits that, that compose silage quality have been shown to have moderate to high heritability. And the uh, people working on this population, uh, Natalia de Leon at Wisconsin chiefly, have documented that there's been genetic gain in the population. So here's a rather ugly figure that, that I made just to show some of the genetic gain. Um, if we look at starch content, and starch is a good thing from early cycles to more recent cycles, there's been this increase in starch content. Um, NDF, or neutral detergent fiber, which is bad in a silage um, setting, has been de decreasing over time, and dry matter has been jumping around. So, so here's a population that we know has been under selection for a number of quantitative traits. So many years ago, um, a team of us set out to, to do a genome-wide association study to figure out what were the loci associated with these traits, knowing that the traits had been improving. Um, we got absolutely no significant hits. So this is a, a study where we had a few hundred individuals and a 50K SNP chip and, and nothing significant. So that's likely because we have a polygenic setting where all of the loci have effects that are too small to map. We thought at the time that we could rescue this with uh, selection mapping, and we used a technique called FST. And for those who don't know it, I'm not even going to describe it other than you look at the difference between allele frequencies before and after selection to, be if the, to see if the population's been changing. So when we did this, um, we again had absolutely no significant evidence of selection. Uh, the, the blue and the red bar are the decent confidence intervals. Uh, the green bar here is, is imaginary. So, so this tells us that there's no significant QTL for any trait using either of these methods to, to identify what's important. Um, but we know the population's improved, so we know there's genetic changes. So, so we were scratching our heads to figure out how can we study uh, genetically, has there been selection on these traits? Or how can we confirm that there's been positive selection on these traits? So now I'm going to describe a project that I worked on with Henry Simeone's group here in Göttingen, um, where we developed a new method to test for polygenic selection in breeding populations. So in many ways, this is an extension of the Koop and Berg uh, method that I mentioned earlier. Um, but instead of requiring many, many GWAS hits that have been published from a 250,000 plant study, um, we're going to use a little bit of a, of a different technique. <clears throat> so the method involves estimating an allelic effect at every single locus in the genome. And we do that using any genomic prediction method. Um, through my talk now, we're using RRBLUP, but you could use anything. Um, and then we also estimate the change in allele frequency across generations at every single locus. So we have an estimated allelic effect and a change in allele frequency. And then we make a composite statistic, which we call G hat, which is the sum over all loci of the change in allele frequency multiplied by the uh, effect size of that locus. And I want to emphasize, our effect size estimates are very bad. We don't know exactly what every locus is doing, is it good or is it bad, but on the whole, we're getting a reasonable estimate. And our allele frequency change estimates are, are actually pretty good, because uh, we have genotype populations before and after selection. And then a nice thing about this statistic is it really facilitates developing a permutation test to, to identify is this significant. Um, so I here is a locus. If we just shuffle one of these values, so instead of doing the sum over all loci of delta times alpha, we do the sum over all loci of delta times a shuffled alpha. Uh, we can make a null distribution that assumes no selection because we've broken the relationship between allele frequency change and effect size. 
So here's what we see in that WQS maze population I saw a minute ago. Um, before I show the test statistic results itself, I want to show just the strong correlations we observed between effect size on the y-axis and allele frequency change in, on the x-axis for all of these traits. So for starch, there's a very significant positive correlation. For neutral detergent fiber, there's a very significant negative correlation. And for dry matter, which again, we don't expect to have been under selection, there's a significant negative correlation. Uh, but when we implement our, our test and do the permutation testing, um, we get much, much nicer results. Uh, so here the red or distribution shows our, our null values and the blue line is the, the test statistic. So in this WQS population for starch, we did see there's evidence that starch had been under selection and it was a polygenic trait that was selected. Same thing for neutral detergent fiber and for dry matter, there's no evidence of selection. So this lined up with the expectation. We've also applied this to two breeding populations of chickens that were, uh, the data was provided by Lohmann Tuzukt. I probably pronounced that wrong, so I apologize. Um, and this is a population of white layers and brown layers. And we implemented the test on an assortment of traits, um, but the most interesting ones were, were laying rate and eggshell breaking strength. Uh, we saw that there was selection for increasing laying rate, which you would certainly expect in a population of breeding chickens. Um, and in the white layers, we could identify evidence of selection, but, but not quite at the 0.05 level for eggshell breaking strength as well. So now I want to spend a few slides demonstrating that, that this method is, is probably quite powerful and, and hopefully showing some of the future applications. So when we do simulations, um, assuming 1,000 QTL are controlling a trait, so a relatively polygenic trait, uh, we get no evidence of selection when we simulate pure drift, and we shouldn't. Um, and then we have strong evidence of selection when we simulate that there's been selection. So, so that looks good so far. Um, what's more exciting is that unlike traditional mapping approaches, where we're trying to map the genes that are important, um, when we're mapping the or identifying the phenotypes that have been selected, we actually get more, uh, more power as we have more QTL, each with smaller effects. So here in the red line, this is the, the power of G hat in a 10 QTL scenario up to a 10,000 QTL scenario. And you can see it just gets better and better as you have more QTL. And this is assuming the genetic variance is unchanged. So more QTL each of a smaller effect. On the other hand, if we're doing traditional selection mapping, and in this case I compared it to FST selection mapping, we have less power, obviously, as we have more QTL. So so when we have a 10 QTL scenario, that's not a very polygenic trait. Selection mapping lets you find the genes. But when we have 10,000 QTL controlling a trait, um, just give up on finding the genes, but we can test which are the important traits. So now a, a few more um, stories about how robust this test is to different perturbations of, of our simulations. Um, we assumed a bunch of sort of standard values uh, for implementing the tests that, that match a lot of breeding populations, and then we changed various things. So if we have a variable number of individuals all the way down from 1,000 individuals to 100 individuals that we're phenotyping, uh, we, have, we have a lot of power uh, as long as there's several hundred individuals. So that's much better than a lot of power with several hundred thousand individuals. So that was exciting. Um, the next really neat thing we saw was that if we change the selection intensity, which we did by altering the proportion of individuals that were selected every generation, um, there's almost no effect of, of this on the power of our test. So because our power comes from pooling information across many loci, instead of having one locus with a very strong signal, it's better to have, uh, or, or it doesn't matter whether we have strong selection or weak selection. In any case, we have um, reasonable power. Something that's more important to, to note is the number of generations of selection does impact this test statistic quite a bit. So if we implement it right after selection began, maybe one generation in, there's almost no power to detect selection. That's because polygenic traits have many alleles or many loci each with alleles of small effect, and one generation just doesn't change frequencies much at all. Um, for intermediate 
numbers of generations, there's strong power, but once we get to too many generations, we start to lose power again. Um, this actually might be a, a result of the way we did simulations, and it, after we do selection for too long, things get fixed. Um, it's not so clear that this would be a problem in, in a real setting, but we couldn't confirm that. Uh, finally, we can, or not quite finally, um, we can do selection at, or we can use phenotypic information from any generation of the selection program. So if phenotypes are available before selection began, we can implement the genomic prediction to estimate effect sizes using that pre-selection material. If they're available after selection, we can use the post-selection material, and it doesn't make a huge difference on the power of the test. And finally, just, just a neat observation is, if selection has ceased, uh, but the population is still around, we can still continue to identify that selection has occurred for, for several generations after the breeding program ended. So, so if we take a population 20 generations post-selection and try to test was it selected for one trait or another, uh, we can still identify that it had been selected for that trait. So software to implement this method is available on GitHub, um, and we just published it in May of this year, so, so hopefully it'll catch on. I'm really excited about the potential uses. And so before I close, I want to talk more about the potential uses, because if anybody's been paying good attention, the, the natural question I would have been asked is, wait a second, Tim, you showed us a few breeding populations that were bred with specific targets, and then you identified those targets that you already knew were were under selection. Whereas that might be fine academically, but where are the uses of that? Um, so in the future, there's, there's a lot of potential uses. For instance, ancient DNA is becoming more and more possible to acquire. Uh, suppose you can get genotypes from an ancient population, and you have genotypes and phenotypes from a modern <laughs> population. Then you can ask the question, what are the traits that were under selection over this historical time period? Uh, in a conservation setting, we might really care about, for management purposes, what traits confer adaptation for a specific species. So, so that can help managers make decisions. Um, if plant X or animal Y are going extinct, how can we help them survive? And finally, I think this is the most exciting in breeding populations. <laughs> uh, there's my postdoc, Sarah Turner, uh, working with a breeding population of Brassicola raceae. And we can do a large phenotypic screen to identify as, as a population, as a species has been adapting to breeding pressures, um, what are the traits that, that helped it get there. So if you talk to breeders, they all have their, their pet traits that they select on, but they sort of keep quiet. Um, other than yield, right? We all breed on yield, but what about how pretty the plant is. Um, and, and maybe some of those pet traits really do help a uh, species or help a, a breeding population improve. And we can post-breeding identify what were those traits that helped the population get better um, by implementing a screen like this. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all these folks and funding sources, um, and I'd be happy to take questions. No, so, um, sorry I didn't make that clear. We can get those estimates from any generation. Uh, so in the, well, I won't go to the picture, but in the maize population, we had phenotypes measured from all cycles of selection, and we used them all um, to estimate effect sizes. In the chicken population, we only had phenotypes from the current population, um, so we only used those to get the estimates. And based on these simulations, we saw that if we use individuals phenotype before selection or after selection, um, any of them are good for generating the allelic effects estimates. And then just to um, make sure I'm, I've been clear enough, the way we do that is we implement some genomic prediction approach. And I say some genomic prediction approach because we think basically any approach would work. So we used RRBLUP to come up with an allelic effects estimate of every locus, uh, but we've also thought about using base CPI or you name it, we could, we could use it and this would probably.
Good, good point. Um, so I think it's, it's probably fair to say that synonymous mutations within coding sequence have much less of an effect than non-synonymous mutations. Um, yeah, we, we could certainly think about whether or not you could have a, a change that doesn't change the protein sequence that could make a small change. Um, but I hope it, it's something you agree with that it's more likely that non-synonymous mutations have a large effect in which case that comparison holds. Um, something I, I should mention though, that, that comparison I showed only looks at uh, the importance of hard sweeps within coding sequence. So Bruce's example yesterday of TB1, which is an upstream promoter, that, that type of change wouldn't show up in that study I looked at. So, so to be completely honest there, or completely transparent when I say, there's the slide. When I say here that this tells us that classical sweeps on new mutations are not the driving force of evolution, all I can say with certainty is classical sweeps on new mutations within coding sequence are probably not the driving force of evolution. Thanks again for the talk.